Good morning. <laughs> Hi there. I'm just about to do a little bit of painting and I thought I'd invite you into my studio right now. I know a lot of us are stuck at home. Uh, the world is in an interesting place right now and uh, here we are, uh, at least here in Canada where I am, there's a lot of recommendations to stay indoors and minimize contact with the outside world. And as artists, we are ready for that. Uh, I know I've been hoarding watercolor paper and looking for more time to paint for ages. And here is basically this gift of time that we've been given to stay home and develop uh, our creative skills and spend a little time thinking about our inner life, which is uh, kind of where I'm at. I'm looking to see the silver lining here. Uh, so the first thing I really focus on doing when I come to paint is just trying to get into that mindset of freedom and flow. And I wanted to talk about that, especially because uh, the second layer challenge and the second layer challenge that we have is wanting to uh, put detail into that first layer of painting and develop the scene and find detail uh, without losing the freshness of the first uh, first layer. And so uh, I wanted to look at that today and I wanted to show you kind of my thought process. Uh, first we're going to switch and I'll show you my reference photo. I think I can do that. There it is. Uh, this is a mountain scene. It's actually not a great photo uh, and you can, but you can download it in the link in the description below the video. Uh, this reference photo is, isn't a great photo and that's a good thing. Uh, when you have a not great photo that gives you the freedom to improvise and to build uh, and to create something pretty that uh, maybe the photo isn't quite showing. Uh, for this particular photo, it's a photo I took. And so that, uh, that gives me the advantage of knowing what, uh, what struck me about this scene and why I wanted to paint it. And uh, it gives me that insider information of the, the feeling, the mood uh, that I wanted to evoke in the scene. So um, we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit of painting. I've actually got a second layer that's all ready to go, but we'll start with the first layer. Uh, I'll demonstrate that, and uh, then we'll move over into that second layer right away because I've got a version that's already nice and dry. And um, I'll try to talk about the colors I'm using, the supplies as well. Uh, I don't have anyone here to moderate the the video. It's just me uh, live streaming. Uh, to give you something to do today, <laughs> to give you something to watch, uh, and to be thinking about your own watercolor journey and how to problem solve your way through the painting. Every painting is an exercise in problem solving. We start with a white sheet of paper and an image in our head, and the problem is how to get that onto the paper. And then once that first brush stroke goes down onto the paper, we have to problem solve uh, how to work with that brush stroke to make something good happen. And if our painting starts going very differently than we planned, and it usually does, uh, we have to be open to that. When you are fighting to fix the painting and get back to that vision in your head, your entire painting is gonna reflect that battle. So you're much better off being able and willing to kind of pivot and follow the painting a little bit and invite the painting to lead you a little bit into the scene. So uh, that's really uh, where I like to go. I wanna welcome those of you who are joining me right now. I'm seeing a lot of people joining from overseas, from uh, the UK, South Africa, from France, um, we have also uh, some fellow Canadians. Linda's from New Brunswick. And uh, I'm seeing names from oh, the Netherlands just popped up. Uh, Henry's from Nashville. Uh, Christine's from Carol California. Anne-Marie's here from, are you in Italy, Anne-Marie? I think you are. Uh, buongiorno to you. Uh, we're going to just switch over to my work surface. And um, I'm going to try to, and not very well, replicate um, the second layer that I have set aside to paint. So um, I've got my paper. This is Indigo Art Paper. Uh, they're cold press, 140 pound. Doesn't, uh, you want to be using 100% cotton paper, but it does not have to be indigo. Um, it's just what I have on hand right now. Uh, and I've been enjoying working with lately. And then I'm going to work with a variety of colors here. I'll try to call them out as I as I choose them. I'm just going to clean a little space on my palette here for mixing because I'm going to do a little bit of color mixing. Um, not very much. Um, I actually, this is my second live session today. I started out um, with a painting session with my Fearless Artist community. And that is uh, my website at learn.angelafair.com. I have a Fearless Artist membership 
where uh, students have access to 20 plus of my online courses, as well as um, live lessons that I do almost every week. And so we did that, um, did a lot of uh, good painting over there and talking through um, some different compositional things. Uh, we were learning about um, how to make your composition stronger when uh, you've got a lot of unity happening in your painting and you want something to kind of bring it to life. And so we talked about that and uh, now I'm over here on YouTube and I don't come live here on YouTube very often anymore because I do spend most of my time in the fearless artist community. Um, so it's nice to be here and uh, nice to see some names and faces that I haven't seen in a while. Um, I'm mixing up a gray here. I'm using cobalt blue and a little bit of burnt sienna. Um, burnt umber works as well. You kind of want to just a rusty reddish brown. And I'm going to add a little more blue than the burnt sienna so I have a blue gray. And that's going to be my sky. And we're going to create um, a nice little curved mountain shape just like so. I'm just going to pop up my reference photo here. Uh, again, it's not a very good reference photo. I'm actually wanting to create a mood that's a little bit murkier. Um, so we're going to we're going to do that. Um, I'm adjusting my mountain shape right now with some negative painting. And that's really negative painting is just painting around another shape. Um, we're doing that very much when any time you're painting mountains and you need to create that contour. Uh, I'm going to touch in a little bit of the pure cobalt blue, just to add a little bit of lively color there. Um, the thing I really like about this indigo paper is the amount of texture that you get there. Um, we're really seeing um, the, the texture of the paper, whereas the pigment uh, kind of granulates into the, into the bottom. Um, I'm going to add some, I'm, I'm going to go quite blue right away um, with my cobalt blue, and we're going to just create some shapes uh, within our mountain here. Um, th these particular mountains don't have, a, well, the ones in the photo don't have any snow on them. I'm going to use, I'm going to paint a little bit of snow. And I'm going to have a lost and found shape. Um, we're going to have the strong contour of the mountain broken up as we let some of the sky bleed down into the scene. And I think that's going to make it really quite pretty. So anywhere my wet brush touches um, my sky, we're going to see some color start to flow. And at this stage of my painting, uh, this is uh, an Escoda Versatil number 10 rigger brush. I'm using the side of my brush a lot more than the point. The point does create some shape here, but kind of dragging with the side of the brush gives you a little bit more of an organic shape, which I think is really um, more attractive than me drawing lines like I'm in a coloring book. I'm just going to carry this blue down and get in this nice strong V shape. I'm kind of zooming in on my mountains and I'm not worrying about too much of the green, green stuff down below. Um, we're going to have some of that showing up here. But again, my painting or my photo is just a jumping off point. Uh, I'm going to add a, a secondary kind of gray color. I'm just spinning my palette till I find the right one. Uh, I think Soda Light Genuine will do it. And that's this one right here. I did spritz my palette to moisten the color when I first started painting today, but already uh, colors I haven't used today are already drying. We're just in a very dry climate here. So sometimes that means you want to spend a little bit more time just kind of working up the color in the, in the palette well before you touch it uh, or lift it with your brush. Um, a little bit of that Soda Light Genuine will bring in a little bit of dark texture there. I think it's going to look nice. This is a wet on dry direct painting. So we're really just painting um, right on the dry paper, but working with enough fluidity that the colors are flowing together to really create some pretty effects. And we're going to keep doing that for this first layer. First layers are your time to be relaxed um, and to think about how all the different elements in the painting fit together as a whole. And um, actually, I think I'm going to mix my green a little bit as well. I like this zoocyte genuine, but it's a little bit gray. And so I think if I mix it with another green just clean this space up so i can do that it'll be just a little bit brighter so we're going to take that zoocyte genuine don't you love a palette you can spin 
this palette is made by robax.com um, and it's been my it, it's probably my favorite watercolor splurge uh, to date so I mixed a little sap green with my zoocyte just to give me a little bit more of a brighter green a little less gray and we're gonna think think about trees I'm thinking actually that um, the aspen trees that are in the reference photo not my favorite so I'm kind of thinking about pine trees a little bit and we're just continuing that visual V shape at this stage so that's giving us that really that gap between the mountains we have that feeling of that pass that mountain pass and let's see next next move is uh and i have you you're seeing me painting a scene improvising uh based on my reference photo but i also have the second layer that i made uh, i've made previously so i'm kind of trying to mimic that so i have my colors already selected from that um, scene and i'm just building on that i want to work with a lot of softness i want my colors to flow I want it open-ended enough, the values to be pale enough that I can build up my darks afterwards. Um, I don't have to do it now. Uh, I like leaving my lower part of my painting a little bit um, with some white paper there. It's gonna bring the eye back up to this scene just a little bit more. And I'm gonna add a little bit of violet at this stage. This is Daniel Smith's Wisteria. And it's an opaque color. It's got a little bit of white in it, so if I drop it into my painting, um, it really stands out. And let's just use the side of the brush. It's gonna get a little bit murky uh, where it touches the greens and that's okay. Um, a few neutrals, quiet neutrals in a few areas actually give your painting some really nice um, peaceful uh, areas that make the vibrant colors look more vibrant. Back to the wisteria, just touching it in. Working wet on dry gives me the flow in the wet areas where the paint's already been uh, applied to the paper. It also gives me um, some neat edges where uh, it runs up into the drier places. And I can keep increasing the size of my wet areas here. And letting things flow. Spattering a little bit of cobalt blue, maybe too much. It's a very strong saturation. I'm working quite quickly here, and if I if there's a supply that I am using that I haven't um, mentioned, I will update this um, live video once it's finished. So um, you can always come back here and take a look at. Uh, the description after I've finished up and I'll make sure those links uh, get put in the, in the description so that you can track down uh, any of the colors, the brush or the palette that I'm using. Um, let's just touch in a little more wisteria. I love that the way the color just um, adds this lively freshness to the painting. I think it's really pretty. So I want to encourage that to be uh, living on the page. And that's what a promising first layer does. When you're working with a first layer on dry paper like this, um, look at the little beautiful white spaces that bring our eye up to the mountains and tell us those are mountains. I don't even have to add detail for us to know that we're looking at a set of mountains. Um, really then we also know, we infer from that that we have greenery, that would be trees. We have um, this beautiful color that looks like flowers. This painting already has a lot of information. And so when we go into it later on to add detail, I think often we feel like we now have to spell everything out, but so much of that information is already here that we can be a little more restrained. This first layer was all about paying attention to how the paint moved and enjoying it, working with these granulating pigments, which create a lot of texture, especially on this variety of paper, and then uh, creating some edges that help guide the eye. I have this strong V shape um, that's carried its way all the way through the painting, and then it's weighted just a little bit more on this side uh, with this flow of color, uh, just to give us a little bit of um, diversity in the painting. 
Uh, if I was too uh, committed to that V shape, uh, it might feel a little bit boring. So just knocking it a little askew right there um, makes it uh, all just seem a little more pleasing. So I set this aside to dry and ordinarily maybe a day or two would pass before I would come back to add detail. And that's where we start to run into problems. So that's where we're gonna move to right away here. Um, I have a version. <laughs> I, I found this in my drawer of paintings uh, today and I really thought this painting deserves to be finished. And it's been actually months since I originally painted this. So I had to draw back into my memory to remember which colors I used. And I think I did a fairly decent job of remembering. Uh, I don't think I missed much, although I think I've used a little bit of lavender in here as well, uh, which didn't show up in, in that version I just did. Uh, but at this stage now, the painting does feel like it needs some finishing touches. It doesn't feel complete. So I do need to go in, even though we see mountains, even though we see trees and flowers, I do need to go in and find a way to give it that finished feel. And so that's where we're at right now. And um, I'm just going to use, uh, I need a support for it. I should have done that first. I'm not gonna be wetting this whole paper, so I don't need to tape it down on all four sides, but I think that I will at, at the very least just kind of clip it at the top on the corners. Um, find another clip here. And then I'll, t I'll use a little piece of tape at the bottom just to hold it in place. If I can find my tape, I know it was here a moment ago. Um, my palette is marvelous, isn't it? And if you are not in the United States, um, you will pay a very high price for shipping, just like I did. Um, but it is really a beautiful product. And I, after that initial investment, I've been just really glad that I own, own this palette. Um, one thing that I really like about it, if you're looking for comparable um, palettes, uh, if you're shopping for a palette, one thing that I really like is that these little wells pop right out. And uh, that's really handy, you know, because a palette of 64 colors, um, a lot of them start to look the same. You know, this section has a lot of really dark colors. It's really easy to go in and grab the wrong color. Uh, so what I often do is as I'm painting, I'll pull out the ones I'm using today for this painting and have them right scattered around. Um, plus I can swap out uh, and rearrange. I've ordered extra wells like this so that I have additional colors that I can bring in uh, should I feel that I need a change. Um, and I have a smaller one that I use for travel as well. Um, they, I, don't, <laughs> I don't make any money by recommending my Robax palette, um, but I do just really like the product. Um, for this, okay, so we're moving into the second layer and the most important thing that you can do when you move into stage two is you want to approach stage two in the same mindset, with the same spirit with which you approached the first stage, um, stage one. You want to be feeling the same kind of relaxed, um, in tune with the painting feeling. And if you're not in that place, your painting will not have that same unity. It will you know, reflect that kind of disjointed feeling. And so I really encourage you, take some time, warm up, study the painting. Remember what it felt like to be on location when you took that reference photo. Um, remember what felt the most important to you about this painting. Pay attention to what you like the most about it right now. We're gonna build on all of that stuff. I really, encourage you to use restraint, to be mindful, which means not being rushed, but just really pausing to pay attention to what's happening on the paper with every brush stroke that you create um, and everything that you add on. We have to look at it and think about how, how is the painting working now? And then you add a few brush strokes and you think, okay, how is it working now? Uh, and one thing that really helps me with that, and I'm just building up um, some additional blues here to create an edge, a uh, stronger edge for my mountain. Um, well, but one thing I really like to do is I, I often step back and I look at my reference photo um, through my video camera viewfinder. I'm videotaping right now and so I can look through that viewfinder and instantly see my painting smaller 
which helps me see the value patterns, which helps me um, observe better how the painting's working. We tend to get in up close to our painting and be absolutely obsessed with every square inch um, when we should be stepping back to look at the painting as a whole. Um, right now, there are a few things that, or there is at least one thing that feels a little bit like a problem in this painting, and that's this bloom right here. Uh, there's a very strong edge where water, um, things didn't dry evenly here. This area was wetter than this area, and as such, this edge was created, and it's a very strong shape. But I kind of don't think it's a problem. I kind of like it. In fact, let's, let's make it look deliberate. Uh, whenever I have something that could be a mistake, um, if you can't erase it, why not look like you put it there on purpose? Uh, so I'm just going to take my blue-gray, and I'm working now with a dagger striper brush. Um, I like the irregular shape, again, using the side of the brush creates and the beautiful point that it also makes. We're gonna use, we're gonna use that for a lot of our edges. But look at how I can now um, create a feeling of maybe some storm clouds here. A little bit of um, additional texture, I think will work really nicely in making this part of the painting look like I wanted it to be that way. In fact, let's even pull a bit of line down here and then it might even look like rain and a brush hair in the way. And just building up those blue grays. Um, it is really a good idea to try to use the exact same colors you started with, not to change your colors at this stage. And um, fortunately my memory is pretty good. <laughs> I, know what, I know what colors I tend to use and I know how um, they look once they're dry, and so that made it easier for me to remember what colors I'd used, even though quite a few months had gone by since I'd painted on this. I'm a creature of habit, so I know what my favorites are. And I'm going to build up, I'm going to darken and strengthen my darks. I'm going to add some edges um, to reinforce some of the shapes in my scene. I'm doing that a little bit right now, but I want some softness too, so that it does look like rain's coming down. Um, I really don't know if my mountains need anything else. Um, let's move down into our trees. So my goal is always I, I, to be present on YouTube. Uh, I do uh, like to share here. And, um, you know, watercolor, the love of watercolor is free. There's no limits on that. Um, but I do also uh, put a lot of time and investment into teaching and uh, a lot of that content is found on my on my own community uh, learning site at AngelaFair.com. Uh, I like the one the one issue with YouTube is we we are um, a little bit random you know I, I don't have a a structured way of presenting content so that you can learn lessons one after another um, but I really am able to do that uh, on my own site uh, and you can go through courses that will really help you intentionally focus and grow your skills. Um, going back to my green now that was the zoocyte and sap green combination I want to get a feeling for these trees but I want them to be artist trees I don't want them to be um, I, I don't know, um, biologist trees or whatever. Um, I want them to be a little bit poetic in their shapes and how I interpret them. Uh, I'm gonna try using the side of my brush, making them spiky and pointy. Because I live in Northern Canada, our trees, uh, our cold winters mean that our trees don't get as big or as lush as they might be where you live. They tend to be a little bit more spindly a little bit more um, stunted or they struggle a bit more. So it happens when it's 40 below in the winter and the summers can often be quite dry and it all makes a difference. So um, the shapes of your trees are going to vary depending on how you've observed 
from their growth patterns. So, but I really like using this brush to create all those little lines. You can see I'm kind of scribbling with it. And then I'm gonna soften a bit over here, I think, and make those shapes nice and large. Uh, I don't wanna have a lot of broken lines down inside of the shapes of the trees. Um, the interesting edges are gonna be much more appealing to look at than if I had a lot of scribbly lines inside of that mass. We have a mass of trees that's kind of fringed by a uh, line. And yeah, I like that actually, it looks really nice. And I actually think I can do a little bit of zooming with this camera, let's try it. So now I've got this wet shape on my dry paper um, so I can actually paint wet and wet inside of it. I can touch in that zoocyte and create some darker patterns there. I can reach for my sap green and let that mix with the zoocyte organically inside of those shapes. And it's creating some beautiful textures there as well. I'm kind of swishing, pulling with the brush here. Um, oh, that's pretty. Um, once it's pretty, I stop, I leave it, I let it live. <laughs> don't, don't paint the life out of your painting. Let it be, let it be alive. Let it be a little bit open to interpretation. That is okay. I might not put a lot of detail in this section. It still feels like flowers to me, even though there's not a lot of detail there. I am going to echo this shape over here. Um, echo it, change it slightly. That's a good, good pattern for composition. Um, so yeah, so the colors I'm using are Daniel Smith. Um, I believe it's a sap green and the Zoocyte Genuine, which is a Primatech color. It's a mineral-based pigment that really creates beautiful, beautiful texture. Now, because I'm left-handed um, and I'm changing my angle, the trees are leaning this way. Um, the shapes of my trees changes. Is this is really annoying? I don't. Uh, we paint stuff different <laughs> depending on which direction it's going. It's just like if you've ever tried to paint a portrait of somebody and you always want them to face the same direction if you're doing like a side profile. Um, it always feels right to paint them facing one direction, the other direction feels wrong. And uh, it's a lot like that with, with painting too. We tend to have a comfort level for one, one direction more than another. And so uh, I have to be careful um, when I'm working on that, weak, that weak, weaker angle um, that I can still um, that's, and that's where having this unpredictable kind of whippy brush really helps because then you can let the brush do some of that work uh, of creating a bit of an unpredictable, you want rhythm, but you want rhythm that feels a little unpredictable. And uh, so that's where the brush is really helpful. It kind of forces you to be loose. I'm holding it in the middle of the handle and that um, creates looseness as well. More scribbling, really working. Um, I don't know if working is the right term. Uh, really trying not to tense up at this point. Uh, I really pay attention to my body language. If I'm starting to feel um, tense and anxious, if my hand clamps down on the brush so I can get a more controlled line, all of those things I pay attention to because it, it indicates my mindset. It shows me that I'm losing my, my um, spirit of the effortless relaxation, <laughs> that intuition. Uh, is starting to desert me and I need to pull back and maybe just pause and breathe for a moment, study the painting through my viewfinder or take a photo of it or prop it up on the other side of the room and look at it from a distance. Um, just take a minute, look outside the window. I, I'm a big reader and my mother used to always tell me if I'd been reading for a while, you need to rest your eyes, look around, and change, change your focus and uh, you know, just look, change your, change your focus, look outside. Um, pause. The painting does not have to be finished today. We focus on um, just getting what we feel and see in the spirit of the moment. Um, I'm really wanting to, the shapes that I'm building up right now to look natural. I don't want it to be evident to the casual viewer what was painted in the first layer, what was painted in the second layer. So that's where these lost and found edges are important. You know, we added this, this additional darkness up in our clouds here 
and it's a really interesting overlap here it's really quite beautiful and um, over here too we've got line but then it kind of blends and matches with what's underneath it and that really helps us we've got a little bit of spatter here but it's transparent so it will really naturally sit on the surface of these violet colors and i'm hesitating so strongly uh, i really don't know that i want to put much in this part of the painting this is so pretty to me uh, I know my my brain says, Angela, you need to put stems on those flowers. <laughs> you need to put twigs and shrubs. And um, I, I'm resisting that urge that I have to do it that way because that, that will make it look more believable. I actually think what I'm going to do instead is add a little bit of spatter over top of this color. And I'm using the wisteria, which is the same um, beautiful kind of orchid color that was already here and a little spatter will give us kind of a second layer it's spattering even up into that uh, a little bit of lavender as well and then I think maybe we'll just add a little bit of diluted color let's try the lavender just a brush mark here and then I'm going to use my brush to draw down some line a little bit of shape there um, really transparent just um, so we'll put that first shape down I'll try and zoom in again so I put that shape down it's quite strong and then we're just gonna tease in a little water in there tickle it in I like that phrase it makes me um, remember to keep a light touch let the paint and water do their do the work of movement it's not it doesn't have to be on me do you think we could put a little bit of cobalt blue in there we've used it in the sky maybe that would add some prettiness to the scene oh that's a little bit strong So this is uh, one thing we should talk about while I'm working here and you're observing. So you get this outsider's view and an outsider's view is kind of what we all want to have when we're working on our paintings because, uh, well, let me ask you, have you ever had it happen where you're working on a painting and you feel like it looks terrible and you're struggling and you put it down and you walk away and when you come back, it actually looks pretty good. And that thing that you thought was such a terrible problem isn't really that bad at all. I know I'm not the only one who's felt that way. <laughs> and so recognizing that we have this tendency to see to, um, to, to zero in and to major on the minors and to think that uh, we need to fix things that really don't need to be fixed. If we know that's our tendency, um, we have to be aware that uh, we need to combat that tendency. We need to fight it. Um, and I feel like I added too much color here, so we're gonna fix that because the pretty stuff is all in that first layer, I can rinse the second layer away. Um, I've got it tilted so that water is gonna flow down to the bottom of the page and we should be able to get back that freshness. And then I'm just not gonna touch it. If I need to, I can come back um, after it's completely dry. But at this point, a lot of things are working and we haven't had to do very much. We've created some beautiful edges that help to guide the eye through the scene. And, um, and yeah, it's always worthwhile to pause and so that you can get yourself back to that outsider perspective. That knowledge that we tend to overwork, we need to stop when we feel like we're almost done. Almost done is usually done. So stop when you feel like you're almost done uh, rather than going and digging deeper into the painting. Um, okay, so let's just move over to, there we go, okay. Um, I, I can see great conversations happening uh, as you watch and comment. Uh, I just want to wrap it up here. Really, I've gotten to the point where it's pretty and I don't want to do any more because I don't want to kill the beauty. Uh, why are we so unwilling to let the beauty live? We want to overwork it and just drive our point home, I think, um, rather than 
Uh, I don't know. If it's like if we're standing outside looking at a sunset, we don't need to dissect every color. We just say to someone, come over and look at this. It's beautiful. Uh, and we don't, we don't have to go further than that. We just share in that moment of beauty together. And we want to be able to do that with our paintings too. I made this. It's beautiful. Uh, or I see the beauty in it. And we invite other people to see that beauty too. Um, <laughs> Uh, Marcella says, sometimes when I come back to the painting, it still looks bad. Well, that happens to me too. Uh, and sometimes, uh, and a lot of times, you know, one thing I mentioned is that I came back to this painting and it had been several months since I last, since I did the first layer, several months. So, you know, I, there was this long, long pause where I just, I liked that first layer. I thought it was beautiful, but I just allowed myself to be not ready to add anything else to it. Uh, and I came back to it today and today I felt ready. Today I felt like I want to do more with this painting. It deserves more from me. And so we, we give it a little bit more. And you know what? I could have gone ahead and continued to add stuff and overworked it and ruined it. And that would be okay too. Um, there's more paper in my drawer. <laughs> I'm hoarding paper, uh, watercolor paper that is. And, uh, and I, paper's purpose is to be used, to be filled with color. And if a painting doesn't turn out, it's a development piece. It's one that will make your next paintings better. And in fact, overworking can often be a good thing because it's teaching you problem solving. It's teaching you uh, color management, brush handling, and uh, building up those layers can actually create some really beautiful depths that uh, sometimes we hold back from doing because we're afraid of ruining our painting. So there's always, uh, there's always a, an upside. I've never looked at a painting by a student and said, well, that was a complete waste of your time. Every painting adds to our learning, our body of knowledge and our toolkit of information. And I want you to have that assurance so that you can paint with that feeling of, I'm okay, I'm just gonna be present in the moment. I'm gonna focus on making this a really enjoyable and beautiful process. And wonderful paintings come out of that kind of focus. Uh, rather than a focus on this painting has to turn out. I've got so much of myself invested in this painting that I just cannot ruin it at this point. Um, there's a real feeling of shame with that. Um, Henry asks, what size of paper is good to practice? Um, that's a good question. Today I'm working on, uh, I think that's a quarter sheet, so 11 by 14 or so, uh, 11 by 15. But uh, And I work a little bit bigger than you probably would at home. I really like, uh, Arsh makes the pads of nine by 12 inches, um, like an A4 size, which are um, a good size for most artists to use. I hesitate to encourage people to work too small. If you're painting postcard size, you can get a lot of paintings done and that can build your body of knowledge. But if you're wanting those looser movements and bigger brush strokes, you need to size up your paper. Uh, but anytime you're sizing up, you also need to be aware uh, that your brush size needs to go up. Um, your, the amount of water you're going to use is going to increase the amount of paint you're going to use. So you, you have to size up gradually if you've been working quite small and you want to start working bigger. Take your time and do it slowly. Uh, it's a lot easier than going from a small tiny painting to a big half sheet of watercolor paper. Um, that's just a huge learning curve uh, and it, it requires you starting over in terms of brush mark making and water load and, and uh, figuring out how quickly everything's going to dry. It all changes when you size up. So you want to take your time um, and be aware of that learning curve. So give, your, give yourself time to get used to that bigger size. Um, I, I have been painting uh, very loosely. Uh, one thing that happens when you paint loosely, when you want to paint looser, uh, and you feel like you don't really have it in you. Uh, a lot of people tell me they, they really want to paint loose paintings, but they just don't feel like they've got it in them because every time they start painting loose, they end up tightening up and going back to what's comfortable and, and, not, and what they have knowledge of. Um, go back, yeah, and we do that. We retreat back into our comfort zone, but feel like give yourself permission to maybe make your warm ups. Uh, come into the studio and just warm up and play with the paint before you start on your serious paintings. Um, give yourself time to feel that looser frame of mind. Um, and get used to that feeling of painting into the unknown. With a painting like this that I did today, let's just look at it again, why not? Um, with a painting like this one, we need to be aware <laughs> that it's painting into the unknown. I start a painting and I don't know how it's gonna turn out because I'm giving it permission to evolve in its own way. 
And so I might start out with an idea in my head, but as soon as my painting starts to deviate from that, I really need to have a willingness to kind of let the painting lead a bit, which does mean that I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. The longer you paint, the more strategies you have for, for uh, working with the paint and making those uh, adjustments. But uh, there, this idea that I'm gonna know exactly how it's gonna turn out, that's false. And uh, you know, if you're feeling like uh, that feeling of unknowingness means you're doing it wrong, <laughs> don't don't worry about that. It's it's really uh, that's where I live as an artist is in that uh, beautiful state of not knowing the next step, but trusting that it's going to be there and uh, pausing to observe the painting and then uh, see that next step and then step out and do it. So uh, think about that uh, as you paint. You don't have to know everything uh, and you probably aren't, especially if you're wanting to paint more loosely. I'm going to be back uh, soon, uh, not too soon, but uh, I, I will be sharing on YouTube here again and uh, talking about this whole idea of teaching yourself to paint uh, like you, letting your own personal style come out and being willing to discover what that is and how what that might feel like uh, for you as an artist. Uh, it's an exciting journey and uh, I'd love to see you come along on that journey with me. Uh, don't forget that I am posting uh, blogging and uh, teaching classes at AngelaFair.com. And um, there's lots of content here on YouTube as well. If you can't uh, afford a class, uh, you're just welcome to binge watch my channel anytime. So thanks for joining me today and bye for now.